This channel is dedicated to reporting true crime and paranormal cases from Australia. If you want to hear more cases like this, be sure to hit the subscribe button and hit the little bell so you're notified every time I upload a new video. I would like to make a disclaimer that I mean no disrespect to anyone talked about in this video. This video is intended for educational purposes only. This case is about the murder of a girl called Rachel Barber. Rachel was born on the 12th of September 1983 in Melbourne, Australia and was only 15 years old when her life was tragically taken. Rachel was described as a beautiful, bright young girl who had an unlimited amount of potential. She was an extremely talented dancer. In fact, she left school at an early age so she could pursue a dance career and start full-time dance school. On the 1st of March, 1999, the day of Rachel's disappearance, she was just as she was on every other day of her life, Super happy, fun, bubbly, nothing unusual about her demeanour, except for one thing. Rachel had been talking to her boyfriend Manny and dance friends about a job she was going to later that day that she said was going to bring her a lot of money. Manny thought her excitement about the job was a little out of character because once she had a job trial working in a cafe and she was so freaked out she hid in the bathroom the whole time. She asked them to keep the job a secret as she had been told not to mention this job to anyone because it was a confidential project that couldn't be talked about yet. Rachel had mentioned that the job was with an old female friend. Manny had some concerns, but he didn't want to make Rachel upset about her first real modelling job. Classes finished at her dance school, and she waved goodbye to all her friends and Manny. This would be the last time any of them saw her again. Rachel and her father Mike had agreed to pick her up from a tram stop in Waddle Park, which isn't far from where the job was. Only Rachel never got off the tram at the time she was supposed to be there. This was extremely unusual, as Rachel hated public transport, and she especially hated the dark. Mike waited over an hour at the Waddle Park stop, and she never arrived. He thought maybe she had gotten off at the wrong stop, so he drove around to some other stops to see if she was there, but she wasn't, so he started to panic. Meanwhile, at home, Elizabeth, Rachel's mother, is also starting to panic because they haven't come home yet and it's getting late. Mike goes to his parents' house and calls Elizabeth from there. He tells her that Rachel never got off the tram and he had been driving around looking for her. Elizabeth rings around to some of Rachel's friends and she's not with any of them. She rings Manny. He immediately panicked and he told Elizabeth that he was shocked that Rachel actually took the job. It was unlike Rachel not to call if she was running late. She was scared of things and she also knew her mum would panic. Elizabeth is freaking out and calls the Box Hill police station. At first, they refused to make this a missing persons case due to the fact that she hadn't been missing for 24 hours. But they eventually agree to take a missing persons report if they go and file it in person, which Mike does right away. After filing the report, they spend hours driving around Richmond looking for her, but don't find anything. They start to suspect that the job Rachel took had foul play involved, and Rachel had been baited. The next day, Mike and Elizabeth return to Box Hill Police Station to drop off some pictures of Rachel to go along with the missing persons report. And when they got there, the officer on duty at the desk didn't have any idea what they were talking about. Turns out, the report had not even been filed, but had been hung on a wall in the office so that the officers could look out for the girl matching the description. The officers hesitantly filed the report, so sure that Rachel was just a runaway and that she would show up on her own. But Rachel's family and friends knew that she was not capable of running away. Manny and Elizabeth decided to go to the shoe store where Rachel had wanted to buy some dance shoes with the money she had made from the job. The shopkeeper remembered Rachel since she had been in there the day before to ask to set the shoes aside. She recalled the conversation Rachel had with Manny, telling him not to worry about the job she was doing, that it was moral and it was with an old female friend. Again, this confused Elizabeth. 
There are so many variations of what this could mean. So of course, this leaves her with more questions than answers. They realised Rachel had never intended to go home that Monday night. She had planned to go somewhere with this old female friend who was going to pay her a lot of money for this job. There were a few documented sightings of Rachel after she had left school that day, but none of these led to anything that could tell where she had gone. She had been seen buying some dance tops and possibly getting on a tram. Some people said they saw her being followed by a young woman with blonde hair who then approached this girl and offered her a place in an illegal brothel in Elstonwick, which isn't too far from Richmond. This lead made sense to the family, as it matched with the story of being paid a lot of money and the female friend. However, they were able to track down this woman. Unfortunately, there was no sign of Rachel in this brothel. In fact, they checked several brothels and there was no sign of Rachel. There were other theories that someone could have recognised Rachel from some modelling work she had done in the past and possibly followed her, but there was no evidence to support this. They thought to check the ads in the newspaper advertising for dancers wanted, but they had to be 18 to apply, and Rachel was only 15. Elizabeth had the idea to look through Rachel's phone books, and even her diary, to see if there were any leads to this old female friend, but there was still nothing that stuck out. They had a look at their phone records and there were a few calls to their home from an unknown number the day before Rachel went missing, but we'll get to that soon. The police only started to be really helpful after five to seven days, but hesitantly, still thinking she's most likely a runaway teen. At this point, they have one lead. Rachel was seen getting on a tram with a woman described as plain, blonde and older. The witness had seen them speaking as if they knew each other and described Rachel as looking like she was comfortable around this woman. But this was as far as it got. On the 13th of March, 1999, it's been 12 days since Rachel disappeared and they've been driving all around Melbourne looking for her. Manny had stayed over at Mike and Elizabeth's the night before and they were driving him to dancing when they got a phone call from the missing persons unit telling them to come home right away. They prayed for good news, but unfortunately they got the opposite. They had found Rachel. She had been murdered. The person in question was a young woman called Carolyn Reed Robertson. They knew her as Carolyn Reed. Carolyn was born on the 3rd of November in 1978. She was 20 years old when she murdered Rachel. Carolyn appeared to be a nice person on the outside, but was deeply disturbed on the inside. Her parents divorced when she was a young teenager, which seemed to have a brutal effect on her well-being. She was never taken to see a psychiatrist or psychologist. Rachel and Carolyn's parents were friends and Carolyn had been a babysitter for Rachel and her two sisters in the past. She was described as someone who stuck to herself and was always in the background. Really quite shy and reserved person. The police figured out that Carolyn had been the person calling Rachel on a private number. Let's take it back a few days before they confirmed it was Carolyn. When the police found out Carolyn had been the one to call Rachel the afternoon before she disappeared, they wanted to bring her in for questioning but when they couldn't get hold of her, they went to her apartment. No one appeared to be home, so they went to Carolyn's place of work. She wasn't there either. The police were able to speak to some of Carolyn's co-workers, who said that Carolyn had taken an unusual amount of sick leave over the past 10 days, and that she had been talking about Rachel, saying that she runs away all the time, and she's bound to turn up. They know this isn't true. They know Rachel had never run away in the past. Her co-workers said it seemed like Carolyn was making a joke of the whole thing. They went back to Carolyn's apartment, but they were still unable to get hold of her. They had the landlord try to open the door with a master key, but the door was deadlocked from the inside, which meant someone was definitely inside. The police called the fire brigade to help gain entry into the apartment. They found Carolyn passed out on the floor. Carolyn suffered from epilepsy and it looked like she had overdosed on her medication. The police searched the apartment for signs of Rachel. 
They found a bag of size 8 clothes that they knew for sure didn't belong to Carolyn, as she was quite overweight. They found several handwritten documents with Rachel's name on them. It also looked like Carolyn had tried to dye her hair. And her apartment looked like she was getting ready to go somewhere. She wasn't responding, but she was alive, so she was admitted to the Alfred Hospital, and after a few hours, she was brought into questioning. Carolyn confessed that she had buried Rachel at her father's property in Kilmore. The police go back to Carolyn's apartment, where they see photos of Rachel plastered all over the walls. They find Carolyn's detailed plans to lure Rachel to her apartment and how she was going to murder her. The police also found out that only a few months before this, Carolyn had tried this once before, but failed because Rachel had told her parents and they forbade her from doing it. This time, Carolyn made sure to tell Rachel not to tell anyone. They found evidence that Rachel's body had been kept in the bedroom closet for at least a few days. A copy of Rachel's birth certificate and a bunch of Carolyn's diaries with disturbing self-portraits, journals that documented Rachel's every move for the last couple of years. It was evident that Carolyn hated herself, was stalking Rachel, and for some reason, she thought that by murdering Rachel, she could become Rachel. Carolyn wanted to steal Rachel's identity. That was the motive for the murder. March 13th, Carolyn Reed Robertson was charged with the murder of Rachel Barber. The next day, the police went to the property in Kilmore and found Rachel's body buried in a shallow grave in a little bush area of the property. She had been strangled with a telephone cord from Carolyn's work, and when they found her body, the cord was still wrapped around her neck. After confessing, Carolyn decided to fight for her freedom, but then at the last second, she pleaded guilty and there was no trial. Carolyn showed no remorse for what she did. She was sentenced to 20 years in prison with the possibility of parole after 14 years. In 2015, Carolyn was released from prison and she still walks free today. They say Carolyn had been a model prisoner and the media was told by an inmate that Carolyn never spoke of her crime. Rachel's family was devastated finding out that Carolyn was going to be released. Elizabeth wishes that Carolyn lives a private life and that nobody harasses her in the hope that she doesn't re-offend. If you enjoyed this video and want more videos like this, please give me a thumbs up And if you want to know more regarding this case, Rachel's mother wrote a book about Rachel and what they went through during this time. A movie was also made based on this case called In Her Skin. I do want to warn people that this film contains graphic scenes. If you want to buy the book to support the family, I have linked it in the description below. Thank you for watching and until next time.